evening, and it's an exciting time. Anytime we get to finish something, um, uh, anytime we have a sense of completion, it's always a good, good thing. Um, as a matter of fact, as, as we open up here and, and people are getting their Bibles turned to Proverbs 31 and um, getting your uh, notepad or your rock and your chisel or whatever it is that you take notes with, maybe you have one of those fancy tablets that has a digitizer pen and you can write and script and converse it to text. Whatever it may be, whatever you're getting um, together to, to facilitate Bible study, uh, I got some um, uh, little, little tidbit of information about being complete in completion of something. So many people struggle reading the Bible, and they struggle reading the Bible because it's boring. And, and not, not necessarily the topics are boring, although some, some of the books of the Bible can get rather mundane, and um, sometimes it, it, uh, it appears to be drawn out. Um, but one of the biggest things that people struggle with is because some of the books are so long. And another thing people struggle with um, in reading the Bible, like reading the Bible through the year or a Bible reading plan, is that you start in January, and by the time you get to March, you've read so much, and you don't, you don't have a sense of completion because you have to go all the way to December. Well, guess what? I have news for you. There are Bible study plans out there that... Um, you only read the Bible one month at a time. And I know before before you jump for joy, let me explain. So what it says is like, let's read the Bible together in January. And then January will have all the Bible readings for January. And you complete that plan. And then the next month is, let's read the Bible together in February. And you get to complete that plan. And then by the end of the year, you would have read the whole entire Bible. But you do it in small monthly snippets. So each month, you get to complete something. And if you've ever read what the Bible study book, the Sunday School Quarterly book, tells us to read, it's a three-month thing. It's a quarterly. It comes out every quarter. So you effectively, if you've read this in a three-month week when we finish it, which we have song of songs to do, we're going to do one or two lessons out there. But the, my point is this, is that you can read the Bible and study it. And with all the different Bible reading plans that are out there, to suit what you're comfortable with, believe it or not. Um, it, it's, it's typically not all about us, but when it comes to reading and studying, there are so many study guides and so many um, things out there that help us to grow and learn and um, develop our relationship with God that it's just uncanny, the access of things that we have today. So, um, with that being said, we have a sense of completion tonight as we finish Proverbs, and we're, gonna, we're almost finished with our quarterly. Like I said, there's a couple of lessons from Song of Songs. Um, Next week, I'll be out of town. I'll be at Liberty University going to school. Uh, I thought when I finished my master's, I'd be done, but apparently I got some other education that's going to benefit me and benefit you guys, and uh, it's going to help make me a better pastor and a better, a better, uh, better able to minister in a holistic way called clinical pastoral education. So Sherwood Robertson, our, one of our deacons, is going to do the Bible study next week, and he and I are going to speak before then and kind of um, pick what lesson we want to go over, and then when I come back, we're going to have a business meeting, and then after that, we're going to get right into Isaiah. So um, we're going to have one, like I said, one more lesson out of this quarterly, and then we're going to have to um, uh, close it, and we get to start Isaiah. And Isaiah is a beautiful book. It's a, it's a wonderful book, so I, I advise and encourage all of you. The quarterlies are here in the sanctuary. We'll put, um, we'll put those in the uh, box outside on the back, back patio back there for you guys to come pick up. Should you not want to come to the sanctuary, you can pick them up outside. And that way you can follow along with us. And um, I likely did have some free access to some things, but um, uh, if, if you need some digital copies of some things, let me know. Send, a, send us a message in Facebook or email me or text me. And I'll do what I can to get you some digital copies of our Sunday School Quarterly for those of you who are in faraway places that don't have um, access to our church or our campus here in North Carolina. So anyway, a lot of good information. Um, for those of you who are just coming in, let's check and see who we have here. Um, we have Mary Ann. Woo -hoo. Hey, Mary Ann. We're excited. Um, it says we're two or more are gathered, right? So we're, we're good. Uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to dive in here, we're going to open up in prayer, and then we're going to start our last chapter of the book of Proverbs. So let's, let's pray together. 
Father God, it's an awesome opportunity to come to you in prayer this evening on a Wednesday evening where we can um, have Bible study. And that's our normal schedule of plenty of time to, to meet with you and meet with each other and to uh, study not only the Bible, but grow in our knowledge and understanding of who you are and what you've done for us and what you've done through Christ. And as we read these, these words of wisdom um, <clears throat> that are in this anthology of, of wise statements that Solomon put together, we are so grateful and so thankful for them. And we ask you that tonight, as we read through this and go over some of these topics, that we can grow, not only in our knowledge and understanding, we can grow in wisdom, and we can grow in practical application of your word to our lives. So we praise you and we thank you for this and all things. We ask a blessing over this evening as we worship and glorify you and you alone. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, let's let's get started here. I'm going to check your hand to see if we have anybody else that's joined us. It doesn't look like we have. So, um, well, we'll, we'll Mary Ann, it's you and me. We're going to make it happen. Um, I know you're excited and I'm excited too. And uh, so let's uh, let's get this let's get this show on the road. So uh, first things first. So I want us to understand that we have a unique perspective as human beings, as mankind, um, and they call it mankind because we are one species. Homo sapiens is what the scientists call it, call us. And um, God created us in His own image. And that, that separates us from the rest of creation is that mankind was created in God's image. Um, and God died for humans. God, God through, Jesus, through Jesus Christ, died for all of humankind. So he died for every single person, of uh, every race, every culture. So we all possess a dignity because we've all been created in his image. So that's an important thing to know, an important thing to remember, an important thing to share with others as we preach the gospel. Before we get into the lesson tonight, let's remember that we are we were all created in his image. Regardless of the decisions we make on this earth because of our influence and sin, we are all created in the image of God. And that is something we must remember, especially during these times of, of frivolous fights and riots and all those other kinds of things. Is all the people that are doing those foolishness things are all created in God's image. Something we must remember. So, one of the first thoughts is, is um, uh, and it ties into the lesson because the, the lesson tonight is going to really focus on the virtuous woman in Proverbs chapter 31 and um, verses uh, 10 through the end of the chapter. And, and what, we, what we have to understand is uh, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 31 verse 10 through 31, excuse me. Uh, what we have to understand is it's, it's spoken from like a third person perspective. So someone is observing someone else. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, what's it like to be watched? Um, I don't like being watched. I don't know why, but I do. I, I, I don't like it. I don't like being watched. I don't like being observed. Uh, I feel like I'm under constant scrutiny. And I think, I think a lot of people feel that way. And I think it's because we're insecure. We're afraid that we're not doing something right. And, and um, that's okay. It's okay. When I was in the Navy, uh, I here's the Navy story. I know you guys get tired of hearing these. So we, when I was in the Navy, I was a, uh, I was in the nuclear field on a submarine, and we had to, um, uh, we had this inspection team that would come on board regularly called course Operational Reactor Safeguard Exam people, and um, we had tactical readiness exams. And we had we had several several um, uh, different inspection teams that would come on and serve and other things and. and what we had to do is a lot of times these these evaluation people would, would examine us, and the only way to examine people is to watch them do things, watch them do specific evolutions for time, procedural compliance, so on and so forth. Um, and and sometimes they would do interviews. They would they would they would watch a qualification interview to see how people did and how what kind of knowledge they possessed to be qualified to do certain things. So anyway, we had these observations, and these were you know. Mid-range ranking officers, lieutenant commanders, commanders, some of them were senior officers, commanders, captains even would watch and observe as part of this inspection. And you have little old people at 19, 20 years old on a submarine or a ship, depending on what part of the Navy you were in, and they would be watching you go through your regular everyday job. And they would watch you do specific things like maintenance and, and specific evolutions that were only done once in a great while during a casualty or something. And they watched you and they observed you. So the question I have 
Two questions. The two questions I have is, have you ever been observed to that and scrutinized to that level? And how did you feel? And that leads me to my next question. is, If you've ever been scrutinized and you have an idea of how you felt, how do we handle critique? How do we handle critique? And that ties into the lesson tonight because we're going to talk about the virtuous woman and we're going to show some qualities and characteristics of this woman here. But how do we handle critique? If somebody was to observe us and they were to record our actions, what would they write? And how would we take it? If you're like me, the first thing you would probably do is disagree with what they wrote. We want to justify why we did what we did. And I'm a big bad person for doing that regularly as I'd like to justify why I did what I did. I believe, believe it or not, I handle critique well. I do. I, I'm harder on myself than most people are on me which is a, uh, a byproduct, I guess, of, of wanting to succeed and wanting to excel and having, having a, uh, a strong desire to be not perfect, but to be better and have success in, in whatever I do. And if, if, we, if we look at the scriptures, it tells us we should do all things as if we were doing it for the Lord. So if I'm doing it for God, I want them to be perfect. So, but that desire of us, for us to want to justify what we're doing is sinful. And the reason it's sinful is because we fail to take critique for what it is, a critique. Critiques can be good, critiques can be bad, but one thing critiques typically do is give us information of how we can become better. And when we justify our actions to prove that we were right or to justify why we did what we did to make us feel right in our own eyes, we're not doing anything but hurting ourselves because we're not accepting the critique. So what we do is, and a lot of times what, we, what we'll see is we'll see women compare themselves to this virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. And, and we'll say, well, they'll do various things, or even, even men will compare the characteristics and they'll look for this in, in a woman, and they should, a biblical example. But here's the thing I want us to break down. These are, there are four key characteristics to this, to this virtuous woman. I wish we had people here because we could soundboard because I wanted to soundboard off of this book. So there are, the, the quarterly in, in, in shows four characteristics. Wisdom, initiative, foresight, and determination. Now we can think of synonymous terms to these. Wisdom, initiative, foresight, determination. We can think of synonymous terms. We probably could add a few terms. But how did, I want us to understand how does this woman display wisdom how did she display initiative? How did she display foresight? And how did she display determination? Well, these four characteristics are going to be throughout the, the verses we're going to study. And what, I, what we have to understand is that these four characteristics are not exhaustive, but they're the beginning. We can dive deep and say, okay, under, under for instance, an example, under determination is um, uh, tenacity and audacity. And under foresight, would be uh, um, predictability, would be uh, boldness, because an initiative would be bold and courageous, and wisdom would be intelligence even. You could, so you, we, could, we could dive into each one of these four characteristics, and we could expound on them, extrapolate them out, and come up with a, a, this whole board to be full of not only synonymous terms, but what this, and what this looks like, pra practically speaking, in life. So, as we go through this tonight, uh, this is the second section of the, of, the, of the assigned reading, the homework, if you will. And as we go into this, it starts in verse 10, in Proverbs 31, 10. We were supposed to read all of chapter 30 and all of chapter 31. Everybody here did their homework. <laughs> Everybody here in the sanctuary did their homework, because I'm the only one here. So, um, a, a verse was one. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. And it says... An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. Or in the King James, it says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? So we already see a, a, a little bit of a, a difference in the interpretation, translation of Scripture. And you have the word excellent, worthy, and virtuous. They're all used synonymously from the original Hebrew. Okay? But I want us to understand it compares a woman, an excellent wife. So not only just a woman, but a wife. And in the New American Standard, and the King James is a virtuous woman. Who can find 
Her worth is far above jewels. Now, the King James says ruby, so I want us to understand there's a reason there's a difference here, and we have to understand why translations are a little bit different. Um, first of all, the King James started in 1611, and all the times it's been updated or revised, if you will, uh, it, it's used um, kind of more common English, but the New American Standard uses the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the, in the late 1940s. So it gives us an opportunity to verify against other ancient manuscripts that the um, the Qumran community had and saved up in these caves in, in the Dead Sea area, and, and that's why the words are a little bit different. So jewels, diamonds, emeralds, pearls, rubies are all extremely valuable, but it says that the value of this woman, that um, uh, this mother is speaking to Lemuel, is the guy's name in Proverbs 31. An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. So basically what it's saying is in these, in these days, in this time frame, people use jewels and gold and silver for monetary currency. You didn't pay necessarily with a coin or a dollar bill. It would be like you paid in jewels, gold, gold dust, whatever the case may be, silver, uh, Platinum, titanium, bronze, even, um, and and the only the only the highest of the high people had jewels. Only like the kings and the queens and the emperors and all these people had the jewels: the rubies, the diamonds, the pearls, the uh, emeralds, the sapphires, the garnets, all these topaz, all these other jewels that look that look blingy and shiny, and all these other stuff look pretty. The common folk didn't have them. So the author of this is saying a, one, a virtuous woman, an excellent wife, is far valued, farther higher than anything anybody can possess on the earth that's, that's tangible. So the, better, better than any precious stone that anybody could find. She's priceless. So who do we have as an example? Who do we have as an example? I'm going to turn this around because I wrote on it on the other side, but I didn't write upside down. So let me, let me turn this around. And so we have, we have this here, and we have the examples of the one, the, there's a couple of examples, but one in particular, this, the quarterly points it out, and I want us to focus on her, because it's a short book, and anybody who wants to look at the, a practical example of a virtuous woman, look at Ruth. It's a very short book, it's only four chapters long, you can read that in one evening, and it's a very flowing story, so it reads relatively quickly. Um, but in Ruth chapter 3, verse 11, Boaz, this is what Boaz, which became her husband, spoiler alert, I ruined the book for you, oh well, um, there's some other good stuff in there, uh, genealogy wise. So, but in Ruth chapter 3, verse 11, it said, Boaz says, now my daughter, do not fear, I will do for you whatever you ask for all my people in the city, know that you are a woman of excellence. All the people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Okay, why is this significant? Well, we have to understand something. Ruth had a reputation. A good reputation. An excellent reputation. She was above reproach in her reputation. And you've got to read the story to understand why she's above reproach. So I haven't ruined that for you. Um, but what, what do we have to understand? What is a reputation? And the rest of this... The rest of these verses will build off of these, these key points that I'm making here, so bear with me. What is a reputation? A reputation is what others think or know about an individual. A man or woman of good reputation is, is, is a person that has, other people have a very high opinion of them. Character is what people have or exhibit. So actions that we do are typically based on our character. If we are a good character, good morals and ethics, right, biblical character, we exhibit these in our actions. We exhibit this character in our actions, and therefore those actions build our reputation. So we could say that our character drives our reputation. Character drives reputation. You don't want a bad reputation? Don't have bad character. How do, you, how do you get better character? 
You can change your character by changing your actions. And you change your actions by having an internal transformation from Jesus Christ. But enough about it. I don't want to get too far away from this thing. I don't want to be too preachy here. So let's, let's, let's look at this. We discussed how valuable a virtuous woman is. Her, valuable is. her value is immeasurable. It's not able to be measured. It's not able to be recorded because it's, it's more valuable than anything on the face of the planet. So it says, it says here, Ruth's reputation, she, oh, she was a person of noble character, had become known to everyone in Bethlehem who knew her because of her action, because of her love. And that's another story of another day. So, here's the thing. It says in verses 11 and 12, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So, the husband recognizes her value, and he trusts her. And the New American Standard basically says he will lack no, he will have no lack of gain. The King James says, so that he shall have no need of spoil. So, what is spoil? Well, back in the day, the reason the kings, the reason the kings in English says it like this is back in the day, the spoil was the spoil of war, and spoil wasn't a bad thing; it was actually a very good thing. The spoil of war was what people. Excuse me. Pardon me. The spoil of war was what people gained from defeating an enemy. Um, not trying to be crude, but uh, women, children, donkeys, mules, animals, anything they could grab, because they would go basically the, the best the, the best way they would attack and conquer a world is they'd go kill all the men, they'd take all the women, they would marry them, they'd have children with them, so pretty much that whole, that whole society was wiped out because all the women would bear the children of the men who conquered them. That's how worlds were conquered back in those days. And so the spoil of war was anything that was found, from animals to people to jewels to, to money to whatever. And so basically it's saying, it's saying that he trusted her. He has no need of spoil. He has no need of the spoils of war or any other spoils because he has her. She completes him. No, I'm not getting into some cheesy movie uh, quote, you complete me on, but I'm being serious, it's the truth. A virtuous woman completes her husband as he completes her. So, um, however, the husband of a noble woman enjoys, um, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke, excuse me, let me read this. Okay, the husband of a noble woman enjoys that kind of surprise when he sees what she's able to bring into his life. So, recognizing, when a husband recognizes the value of his wife as a virtuous woman, or a woman of noble character, it's important. So this, what, what, what can we take from this? If a husband has a, a woman of noble character, he should prize, he should uh, not prize her, he should recognize her as such and inform her that he sees this. In her. Not only of her potential, but of her character and her worthiness. He should let her know that she's worthy. He should let her know that she's worthy. These shouldn't be internal thoughts that are kept inside here. They should be transferred from the brain to the mouth to let the woman know that she is a woman of noble character and of great value. He sees how valuable she is, and he recognizes the value that she adds to his life. So, here's another thing. It says, uh, uh, the woman brings um, wealth into the house. Because she does so, she will do good, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Well, how do you bring good? She's an asset to the family, an asset to the house. Right? Um, basically, they, there's a saying that says, behind every good man is even a better woman. And that's typically what this is basically getting at. The people who know the couple recognize that she is the reason why the man has become the way he is. The success he has. The, the, the happiness he feels with life. The joy he has overall. That's why it says in Proverbs 18.22, right? He who finds a wife finds a good thing and attains favor from the Lord. There's a reason why Proverbs 18.22 says that he who finds a wife 
finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And the favor he obtains from the Lord isn't necessarily divine providence. It's the favor that he recognizes that this is a person that's going to complete him. In Genesis 2.24, it says, The man and the woman were joined together to become one flesh. They become one, one people. That's the way God designed it. That's why marriage is a beautiful thing. That's why the Catholic Church celebrates it as one of the seven holy sacraments. Because marriage is a beautiful thing between a man and a woman. And when they come together, they complement each other. That's why in the King James uh, translation of the Bible, it calls the wife a help meet. Because they help, she helps to meet, she meets him and helps him where he is. Helps him and compliments him and he compliments her. And that is why this is a continual blessing to the man's life. And he, he'll never be threatened by her because God designed us to be equal. Man and woman are equal in value and worth. They are all, women are only subordinate in role. And I know that's a hard thing for us to swallow, and I'm not trying to be dogmatic or misogynistic or, or even chauvinist. I'm just stating the way God designed things. God designed hierarchy in everything, even in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is subordinate to the Son, and the Son is subordinate to the Father. And as such, on this earth, we have hierarchy. Man and woman are both equal created beings, both equally worthy in the eyes of God, and, and, and but in role and in their position on the earth, and the roles are supposed to have, the woman is supposed to be subordinate to the man. That's the way it is. That's the way it was written. I can't change it. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't recognize the value of this companion that God's given man in his life. And that is the blessing that we have. Matter of fact, that when it says evil, she won't do him evil. Not only will she not do him evil, she will not allow evil into the house. Because she's a woman of noble character. She won't allow evil into the house. That means she's a woman that goes to her husband and says, hey, don't talk like that. Hey, don't say that. Hey, clean up this. Hey, do this. Not to be henpecking or, or poking the bear, per se, but to, to make sure that house is a place of worship to the Lord. And she can be counted on to be a blessing all the days of her life to her husband and the family that the Lord blesses him with. So, here's the question. In our church family, who comes to mind... When you think about the woman described in just these verses here, not the whole passage, just those, those verses there. Verses 10, 11, and 12. Who comes to mind? You can chew on that. Don't, don't all answer at once. While you're chewing on that, we're going to move on to the next few verses. Verses 13 through 16. Okay. It says, She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a hand a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. So what, what is this, this thing? So there's a, a key point here. She constant provision for her family. It says she seeks wool, flax, and worketh, and works willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. So she's constantly, the overall theme in all of these verses are constantly providing for her family. She sees that as her goal and her desire to constantly keep the house. And I'm not saying that's where women belong. I'm just saying that's the context of the verse here. Okay? She constantly provides for her family. She constantly seeks. This is this initiative. She, all, she has the initiative to continually seek ways to better her family as a whole. Even to the point of Making sure they have food. She rises early in the morning and gives meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So that means that she maintains order and discipline in the home. She keeps a schedule. She, she keeps a systematic, methodical approach to how things should be done within the household. To the point that she gives her maidens a portion. So that could be interpreted one of two ways. She gives her maidens a portion of the food. But more likely, contextually speaking, it's she gives her maidens or the servants in the house or in this case, if you don't have servants, you have children. She gives the children responsibility so they have their portion of keep, keeping the house running. She organizes things. She's an organizer. This woman is a, is a uh, beautiful example of not only organizational skills, but also multitasking and making sure things run smoothly. 
And that means she delegates. She doesn't, she's not a perfectionist per se, but she delegates. She's okay to let go of things and release control to other things, other people in the house so that we can all work together. So she teaches not only the husband, but the children and everybody else in the house how to delegate, how to multitask, how to do the common uh, economical things that happen at home economics, if you will. So she's fiscally responsible. She's prudent and she's wise. Now, why is that? She considers a field. She doesn't, it doesn't say she rushes out and buys it, she considers it. So that means she evaluates. Not just the field, but this, 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 this imagery here can be broken down or extrapolated out into many other contexts. She thinks. She ponders. She meditates on things before she does them. She's not rash. That shows logic and it shows reason. And it also says, uh, and then she buys it. So, so she thinks first, and then she acts. And what, what is she thinking about? She considers a field, and then she buys it. What is she thinking about in this context of that specific field? Well, she's thinking about two things. One, is it worthwhile to have? Is it a need or a want? Can I, can I further provide for my family with it? Very often today, here's a preaching moment. Sorry, I can't help it. I'm a Baptist preacher. Here's a preaching moment. Very often today, men and women alike will buy things they don't need because they want it. Not because they need it. And the purchase of that item doesn't do anything for them. I know we all have impulses. Some of us have impulse buying. Sometimes you see something like, I just have to have it. Sometimes we, we ought not to do that. Even if it's something like $40. Like, for instance, I like a yo-yo, believe it or not. A yo-yo, you know, a little toy, walk the dog, sleep the baby, whatever thing. Well, and we go to Disney World, Disney Springs, and I bought a... Uh, I bought two Dunkin' Yo-Yos. I got a little Dunkin' Yo-Yo card. I bought two Dunkin' Yo-Yos. And I played with them for like three weeks. And when we came back from Florida, that time I played with them a little while. And then they're still sitting in the wife's van in the same door, the same door holder that they were sitting in two years ago when we bought them. But they're there when I need them, which I never knew. Them. <laughs> but anyway, this woman considers the field, she buys it, and it says, with the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. So with the fruits of her hand. So what does that mean? The fruit of her hand. She recognizes the potential productivity of it, and if she works it, which is a fruit of her hands, work, diligence, labor, she labors in it to make the field productive, to make it productive to produce something. Not necessarily to produce an income for the family, but to produce food for the family. The whole goal here is she's caught, this woman is constantly seeking opportunities to care and provide for her family even if it means going outside the home to do so. The ultimate goal, though, is she always rolls back to what is best for her family. That's why she's prudent. She's wise. We talked about wisdom. We talked about initiative. Let me see what the other two are. Foresight determination. She's fortuitous in the fact that she sees the potential value of this field, and she's determined to make it a value by working hard to make it happen. Okay? She's sure in her reputation. And we're going to skip a few verses to verses 23 and 27. 23 through 27. And it says, Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth it girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. It says, she looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. So let's start with that last one. She's not idle. That's a good point. She doesn't sit around and waste time. We're going to cover that. We're going to come back to that. But I want to get that other way first. So her behavior complements her husband. So we're talking about back to the blessings in favor from the Lord. Okay? But the key here is that he is established in the city gates because of the virtuous woman at home. He's able to sit with the elders of the city because he has a good reputation, because his wife has a beautiful reputation. She makes the man better than what he already was. The family makes the man better than what he already was. A man can only go so far by himself. A man who, who is, you look at successful men, this is a fact. Successful men almost always, I'm not going to say there's not an exception to the rule, 
But almost always, like 99.9% of the time, it seems, behind every successful man, there is an equally successful woman. I went back, I already said that before, but I wanted to reiterate that. He is able to be established because he has a wife at home that's virtuous, that's a blessing. And I look at this as a, as a great example in my own life. I am able to do the things that I do because I have a good woman at home who takes care of that. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> who takes care of the house. When I go to work in the morning, I don't have to worry about my children, where they're at, what they're doing, if they're going to eat, if they're going to be okay at school. Well, now they're at school at home because of the COVID thing, but I didn't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about getting a phone call or telling them to do this or do that. I can concentrate on my job because the home front is taken care of because my wife's at home with them and taking care of them and taking care of the house. I come home from work today and she was making supper. Not that that's what she has to do, but because out of her love. That is the blessing. I can be successful because I have a help me, a compliment to my life that makes me that much more successful in my life. I can sit at the gates of the elders of the city, in this case, because of the wife I have at home. She makes fine linen and sells it. So she makes fine product. Okay, so this, 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 this gives an example of, of what attention to detail is. I don't, I don't know if anybody's ever heard that. But attention to detail is how much attention we give to the details. If you are highly um, <clears throat> different personality types, believe, believe it or not, um, from this, uh, I forget, this emotional intelligence test I took multiple years ago, We'll identify the type of person we, uh, th uh, the type of people we are. Yeah, can't talk. Um, and there's like four different groups of people, A, B, C, and D, uh, one, two, three, or four, however you want to label them. And each of these different people groups, each of these different little groups, have strengths and weaknesses. Not every, not every person is has a strength of attention to detail. That's what I'm getting at and telling you all this. However, the virtuous woman has enough attention to detail to create good products. So some people who are artistic might not seem to have great attention to detail, but they have to have attention to detail to be artistic. What I'm trying to get at is you don't have to fall into a certain personality type to have attention to detail to make nice things. But she has attention to detail. She says quality workmanship. So here, why is this significant that it talks about selling them to the merchants? Well, I want to tell you this. Says she did, and she delivers girdles unto the merchants. The merchants were people who came from afar. They came in on ships and stuff. And Solomon and, and his grandeur, he had a fleet of ships that went to the went all over the world to get stuff. That's why he had peacocks and stuff in his kingdom. But he also had merchants come in from other places to come into the seaport to sell stuff. There's actually a port in Israel called Haifa. Haifa, Israel. The Navy used to pull in there multiple years ago. I don't believe they still pull in there anymore. But sometimes they pull in there before they went to the, to the, uh, to the Suez Canal by Egypt. They pull in the Haifa, restock their supplies, and they go through the canal and go over in the, into the Persian Gulf. Um, but, uh, but anyway, uh, so they, they had these seaports, and it says she delivered stuff to the merchants. So the merchants wanted her material. That's how much quality it was. They were going to take what she had, and they were going to sell it somewhere else. So they were going to pay her and then for what she gave them, and then she, they were going to take it and sell it to other people. So that talks about the diligence she has, or her, the fine product she makes, the attention to detail that she has, right? And it says strength and honor are her clothing. Well, she has confidence in her abilities, and it comes because of her secure relationship with God. So going back to the relationship we have with God... Okay, we can be secure in ourselves. We don't have to have weak self-esteem. We don't have to have a lack of self-esteem as long as we have a secure relationship with God. We have to understand that we are worthy in God's eyes, which brings us back to men and women being created equally in God's eyes. One is not more valuable or more worthy than the other. And for so many centuries, it was taught that women are not as valuable as men. It was taught and believed and practiced that Women were uh, a secondary um, creature in the species of, of mankind. And that is just so not true. The only, the only subordinate is in the role, not in the value. And um, there is great value in being a woman, great esteem in being a woman, just like there's great esteem in being a man. And we should welcome what God created us to be 
and have a relationship with God that encourages and strengthens what He's made us and live to the fullest potential that God's created us to be within the gender that He's created us to be and accept it with open arms. And it says, um, she, because she has a secure relationship with God, strength and honor are her garments, right? But part of being noble and having good character is even though there are uncertainties in the future, we can rest assured with the determination that we're going to be okay because God has us. Because we have a secure relationship with Him. Having a secure relationship with God means that we rejoice about anything that comes. Philippians uh, 4 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So, whatever happens, we have complete confidence. She has complete confidence that she can handle anything that comes her way because of her relationship with God, because of her secure relationship with the Lord. So, now, the Bible teaches, um, this, this is a biblical teaching here, obviously, because it's from the Bible, but I want us to teach on something else. When it says, um, uh, she does not eat the bread of idleness, it means she's a good steward for what God's given her, and that's a biblical concept that's taught in more places than just here. The biblical concept of stewardship. God gives us everything, and we are responsible with everything that he's given us. Look at the parable of talents. We're given, this is off the topic, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, we're given um, spiritual gifts. In as much in these spiritual gifts, we are responsible for how we use them. And if, and if you look at the parable of the talents, um, and, and you look at that parable in the Gospel of Matthew, um, and it's not in the quarterly here, but uh, if you look at that, you look at that, uh, that parable, and you look at what people did when they squandered the talents. The guy who squandered, he took it and buried it and didn't do nothing with it. He was yelled at, thrown into his dungeon, and his talent was taken away and given to somebody who already who had the guy who had, who had taken five and made five more. A good steward is more than just not wasting time. A good steward is somebody who takes and diligently works for what God's given. Someone who doesn't waste time, someone who's constantly busy and constantly working, typically has a good reputation because they're known as a, a person of good character and good morals and ethics because they don't waste. People's work ethic a lot of times gives them a job but what, regardless of how much knowledge they have. In verses 28 through 29, it says, Her children that rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou and sell us them all. So now we're talking almost in a first person. You, it's passed them all. A lot of people are virtuous. She surpasses all. Well. She's the best woman in the world. How we close that out. But the first point, her children raise up and call her blessed. So um, this, is a, this, is a, this is a unique example. This virtuous woman most of the time gets her praise after the fact. She doesn't have instant gratification. Her children rise up and call her blessed doesn't mean that they rise up in the morning and say, blessed are you, mother. It means that she doesn't, they don't recognize how blessed they are to have the mother they had until they get older. Interestingly, she has a very thankless job. People don't recognize, even though we're supposed to let her know how worthy she is and how much she's loved and appreciated, this wife, the virtuous woman, the excellent wife, has a very difficult and thankless job. And a lot of times, some of the things she does are not recognized until sometime later on after the fact. So it's not reciprocated immediately. It's not rewarded. There's no instant gratification. And that's burdensome. But the rest and the joy come later. This is an example of how we should not work for reciprocation, but we should, or the, the reward, but we should work and have diligence because that's what God expects, which is another reason why this woman has good character, because she continues to prosper, she continues to succeed, and she is praised by her children and her husband because she continues to demonstrate a strong, valuable work ethic. Verse 30 says, Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord shall be praised. Favor is uh, uh, charm. Um, someone can be charming, but that doesn't mean they're being truthful. So that's why it says favor is deceitful. Um, 
charm people that are charming can can um, uh, can be captivated by people who are charming, but but uh, a charm being charming doesn't mean that you're honest. Matter of fact, a lot of people who are charming, you'll hear them say that guy is charming or she's charming, or um, a lot of times it's 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 very it's very manipulative. You play on people's emotions and their reactions to you, and um, it's very easy to manipulate people into seeing you for something that you are not. Um, that's why it says favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain. Beauty is fleeting. Um, Randy Travis sings a, a couple songs about that. Uh, uh, um, he says, I'm going to love you forever and ever again. I believe that's the name of the song. And he sings the chorus, or part of the, one of the verses, talks about um, a, a young girl's brown hair turns gray. And, um, and he says he, he doesn't care if it all fell off and he'd love her anyway. Beauty is fleeting. Beauty is, is vanity. Um, but a woman that fears the Lord shall be praised. Something that cannot fail or fade away is a woman that has fear of the Lord, a reverence, for a right relationship with God, and preparing ministry for children or for people. Um, there's nothing more beautiful than when my wife was sitting on the floor in her pajamas. When she was teaching the children, she would sit on the floor in her pajamas in her bedroom and prepare a study, a Bible study for them. Nothing more beautiful than that. Nothing more appealing to me than that. In verse 31, it says, Give her, uh, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. The fruit, the affirmation, encourages her. So she can see the fruit of her labor, even though she might not be praised immediately and it may be delayed gratification. She sees the fruit of her hands, and she knows that she's valued and loved by God because she's treasured because of the walk she has with the Lord. So the, her works share the story of her devotion to God. Everything she does is this, she's doing it for the Lord. And the gates, this thing, we, we see this word gates. What does it mean? Well, the city gates was where all the commerce took place. It didn't take place in people's homes. It didn't take place in the store. A lot of stuff, a lot of public, main public events took place at city gates. That's where everybody, that's, that's where the entrance and exit to the city, that's where all the people hung out and all the things, you know, stuff took place and happened. And her works praise her in the gates. Her works speak for themselves. And, 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 the old, and back in these days, praise greeted people. When people greeted you welcomingly, that means you had a good reputation, a good character. So this praise for good character precedes her, and she will be noticed and affirmed by the people of the gates, at the gates, that the town elders would, would greet her with praise because they recognized her value. Here's a question. How do you honor other believers who show that they live to honor the Lord? How do we honor other believers who live to honor the Lord? How do we live to honor people who honor the Lord? It's a good question. You know, one thing comes to mind, we can recognize people, but many people who work to honor the Lord don't want to be recognized because they don't want any credit for themselves. They want to give the credit to the Lord. You know, I struggle... When I first started preaching, um, not here, when I actually first started preaching in West Virginia, um, I preached probably, I think I preached two or three times a month in the evenings at church service over a summer once when I first started preaching regularly um, before we moved to South Florida. And then I taught Sunday school lessons in North Carolina and Red Oak and stuff and preached at the Rock Creek, but I have I have a hard time accepting praise for that. Oh, that's a good job. That's a good job. Oh, you're a good guy. And I, I used to downplay that. And Dr. Jerry Warren, who's the pastor, who was the, at the time the pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church in West Virginia, where we went, where we, we were members when we lived up there, told me a long time ago that when somebody praises us or gives us praise or honors us for the work that we're doing for the Lord, all we have to say is thank you. Because they are showing up, they are showing their appreciation for what God's doing through us and the example that we're setting. So we should say thank you. 
We shouldn't detract from it. We shouldn't make them feel small or insignificant by giving them some theological perspective of how we're unworthy and everything. Now, all we've got to say is thank you. So there's one thing we can learn from the day that's wis biblically wisdom, biblically wise, I should say. And biblical wisdom, we should learn that it's okay to take a compliment. Just don't let it go to our heads. A simple thank you when somebody pays us a compliment or honors us for the work we're doing for the Lord goes a long way. It lets the person know that they're validated, that gave us the compliment, and that it gives them credibility and allows them to, to feel like they were successful and that they were heard. doesn't hurt their feelings or detract from them and rob them from the blessings that they're trying to give to us. And when we say thank you, we're honoring God because we know that we wouldn't be able to do anything if it wasn't from the Lord. And we're showing respect and admiration for our fellow man. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I thank you for your attention and for listening this evening. And I pray that we learn some things. Um, the virtuous woman. And I would say that even though my wife doesn't go buy a field or plant vineyards in it, um, and um, she doesn't get up early in the morning to cook me breakfast if she's watching right now, that's, that's not a hint. She still meets these qualifications and these, these characteristics. Because it's not the individual actions that, were the, that are the focus here. It's the characteristics of wisdom, initiative, um, I forget, determination and foresight. How, how being fortuitous is a good thing. Wisdom, initiative, foresight, determination, those four characteristics, like I said before, we could extrapolate, we could extrapolate them and make them... Um, Make them uh, into a longer list of characteristics in, in synonymous terms. But in reality, if a woman possesses these four characteristics, that's a virtuous woman. doesn't matter if they exactly fill the example that was set by the woman um, in Proverbs 31. If they possess these four characteristics, that's, that's, a, that's an excellent woman. And men need to realize the value and the blessing that they have added to their life when they have a woman with those characteristics. Because these characteristics, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, the initiative and the foresight and the determination, these two things come from not having idle hands. If you have initiative, you don't have you don't have desire to be lazy or waste your time, so you're a good steward with the time you have. Be having being fortuitous or having foresight is is a beautiful thing because it lets you look at what God is doing and you follow him and work with him there like Henry Blackman says. Don't, don't wait for God to come meet you. Go find where God's working in. Work and uh, meet with him there. And determination. The sheer determination the grit, the tenacity to continue pushing through even when times get tough because we rely on God and not on ourselves. Those four characteristics are a beautiful thing. So, I appreciate all of you coming and watching tonight and I, I, I pray that you were as blessed as I was and reading it and studying it, I pray you were as blessed as, as, as I was as you heard it and um, were able to receive it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I do thank you so much for tonight. The opportunity we have to come again together with the technology to have a Bible study. I praise you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And I pray that we can learn from this virtuous woman. That man and womankind both, both of us, both genders, can grow in their relationship with you by the example set forth in Proverbs 31. I pray as we continue our Bible studies on Wednesday nights that we are blessed and we are lifted up. And I pray that as we leave here tonight, we take this opportunity to be emboldened and challenged by you to go out and further your kingdom. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.